Well, welcome to our live stream overtime session. Uh, we do this every other Tuesday after our uh, live stream. It's first come, first serve. Uh, you can register at deantinneytutoring.setmore.com. Uh, and uh, if you don't see it, it's because it's capped at 15. So uh, head over there. Uh, tonight uh, we uh, have, I think, uh, max capacity. Uh, welcome, everybody. Go ahead and uh, put in the chat, it's first come, first serve, uh, what you would like to talk about, and then do we knock it out. It's uh, We don't go until midnight. It's, you know, 45 minutes. I think last time we were here till 7.30, so no promises, uh, but we go. So whatever you want to talk about, put it in the chat, and first come, first serve. By the way, one question at a time, I answer your question. Uh, then we do the next question, then you can resubmit another question if you'd like. Well, listen, again, muni bonds, that's what? You want to spend three hours on that? You got to be a little more uh, uh, narrow on that. What part of muni bonds? That's a two-hour lecture, all available on the YouTube channel. You can put muni bonds in the channel search bar. You can watch tutoring replays of an hour plus on me doing munis with uh, people who've been kind enough to let me replay their tutoring session. You can watch two lectures on that. So, you know, we need more than that about munis. So what part of munis? If you narrow that down a little bit, I'm more than happy. So Alana, if you just tell me what part of muni bonds that you would like to discuss, I'm more than happy to do that. Uh, hi there, taking the SIE Friday. I wonder if I could explain how interest rates move depending on inflation, deflation. Well, they. I'm going to rephrase that in test phraseology. On the SIE, you're held accountable for monetary policy and fiscal policy. This is testable on both the 65 and the SIE. So I always joke, if somebody asks you about economics, finance, or investments, and you want to sound smart, you should say it has a lot to do with interest rates. And people say, well, what about them? You say they fluctuate. They say, is that good news or bad news? You say, well, it depends. Can you tell me more? So test question, the person's in charge of interest rates. And again, inflation is too much money chasing too few goods. Deflation is too many goods and not enough money. Both of those are bad economically. And so test question, who's in charge of making sure we don't have too much money floating around in the economy or too little money floating around in the economy? This is called price stability, price equilibrium, very testable. Who's in charge of that? You can unmute and answer if you'd like. If you don't want to answer, that's fine too. Who's in charge of monetary policy, making sure there's not too much money or too little money in the economy? Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve Board, our central bank. Definitely, they have a dual mandate that price stability and full employment. And Jerome Powell has been very clear right now saying that what he's interested in is price stability. And he's been fighting inflation by raising interest rates. So the answer to your question about interest rates is linked to monetary policy. And you're held accountable for four interest rates. The interest rate the Fed targets, and this has at what, five and a quarter is the target rate right now, is called very testable 65 and SIE Fed funds. Fed funds, test question, is the most volatile of all the interest rates you're held accountable for. And the Fed funds is banks with excess reserves lend into banks with deficient reserves. You know, reserves are how much you have to have in your till to meet your everyday demand for banking. I kind of know that my bank is busy with my money. But I don't expect that if I walk in and ask for $1,500, I'm going to the dentist. And he said he's going to give me a gum therapy. And I said, what's the difference between a clean, uh, clean gum therapy? I'm guessing a few hundred dollars because that's what it sounds like to me. It's a cleaning. It's like a thousand bucks. And he said, give me a discount for cash. So on my way down to the dentist, I'll stop and get some cash for it. Uh, I don't expect my bank to say, Dean, we're busy with your money. I expect they have some money in the till to give me a thousand bucks, right? So that's called the reserve requirement. So banks with excess reserves, limited banks with division reserves. If you can't get it from a fellow bank, test question, 
you can borrow the money you need from the Fed directly. To ask a question, that's called the discount rate. That is set directly by the Fed. So you got to know about these interest rates, where the money is coming from, where the money is going to. Now, you asked about interest rates, and the Fed has been raising interest rates to fight inflation. They've had a restrictive monetary policy. They've been raising interest rates to dent demand. And they've been very honest. They think, well, we can slow down the economy by raising interest rates. You know, and then what they're hoping is they don't slow down too much, right? We've been talking about right now, are they bringing it in for the mythical soft landing? Are they going to kill it? We're going to go into a recession, right? Now, they've said here recently, boy, this is going to be interesting. I think it's next week. The Fed is meeting, the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee, and everybody's expecting them to cut interest rates by a quarter point. So that would be expanding the money supply. So the most common tool of Fed is not the reserve. The most common tool of the Fed, to ask question, oh my God, I got a bunch of people in the waiting room. <laughs> my cat must have not worked. <laughs> Uh, I, I got. I, I usually put on my doorbell. If you're just joining us, I apologize. I usually put on the doorbell, but I didn't have the doorbell on. So uh, I don't know how long you guys were out in the waiting room. I hope it wasn't too long. Uh, we're answering the questions in the order we received them in the chat. First come, first serve. I've asked uh, Alana to narrow her question about muni bonds down. She was for, at first in the chat, but you know, muni bonds, you know, I always joke, if you ask me, like how the universe works, we uh, tackle that question at the end of the session. If you ask me, like, Dean, how do I do straight line amortization, decretion? You know, that's a little more doable. Anyways, uh, uh, Nate uh, is taking the SIE, and he was asking about interest rates, which is very testable. Where we're at right now, if you joined us late, is talking about the most often used tool of the Fed called Open Market Committee. The Fed buying and selling government securities, Nate. And you got to know what is the effect on interest rates when the Fed buys government securities. When they buy government securities, the money supply goes up and interest rates go down. They've uh, recently, Nate, have been selling government securities. They said they're starting slow, $100 billion a month. I'm like, man, $100 billion a month, that sounds like a lot to me. But I guess if you start with $7 trillion, that's not, you know, a whole lot. But anyways, that would be a test question. They sell government securities. Money supply contracts, interest rates go up, right? Makes sense. So there's more money, you need to pay less for it. If there's uh, you know less money, you got to pay more for it. You know, so that's the interest rates, and that's testable. Uh, Sixty-five SIE. Uh, when interest rates go up, it makes the dollar strong. It attracts foreign currency. People say, "Wow, I can get five percent in the U.S. Treasury bond. Sign me up." And so then you get tested on the uh, dollar going up, and what's that effect? on trade, the trade uh, deficit, the trade balance, right? And when the dollar's strong, that's good for a guy like me because I'm an importer. Strong dollars are great for Dean because I import Swiss watches and, you know, uh, whiskey from Scotland, scotch, and, you know, fermented agaves from Mexico. So I'm all about a strong dollar, you know? So it, strong dollars make imports more attractive, exports less attractive. And that would uh, lead to a trade deficit, right? Because, you know, uh, Dean's going to buy a lot more uh, Mexican beer and tequila. And my four friends at Caterpillar are not going to be able to sell as many excavators and rock trucks and bulldozers. You know, it used to be 10 pesos to get a buck. Now it's 20 pesos to get a buck. For me, that's wonderful. My $80 bottle of tequila is now 40. Right? But it's not so good if I'm selling, you know, stuff in Mexico because I get twice as many pesos. All right, let's see what else you had in there. I think I answered the inflation, deflation. Disinflation is what we're having now. It's still up, but it's going down, right? So we started, what, would we hit 8%? My God, we were 8%, and then we went to like 4%. We're still a lot, and then I think the last time I saw, we were 2.3, I think. So that's disinflation, Nate. Uh, some questions have interest rates rising during deflation, uh, but also during prices. Well, we have what's called stagflation, Stagflation is high inflation and uh, uh, on high unemployment. Uh, but I don't think that's going to be a big deal on your test. I would know we just don't want to have too much money or too little money. Right? Just now. now, I left out two interest rates. I told you about discount. told you about Fed funds. Anybody recognize the other two rates you're accountable for that Dean didn't discuss? This would be an answer set. A, discount rate. 
B, Fed funds, C, and D. Prime. Good job, Stephanie. Prime. Test question. Prime is what banks charge their best commercial customers. That's testable. I joke, Stephanie, that's what you pay to borrow money if you don't need to borrow any. That's what, you know, Alphabet or Apple or Exxon mobile pays to borrow money. What's the last one that'll be in the answer set? Did you say federal funds? I did. So far, we've got discount. We got fed funds. And we've got, is you supplied us with Prime. So we're missing one more. Very testable broker call. Broker call. That's what banks charge brokerage firms for money, right? Whatever they charge me, I'm going to charge you a little extra. So that's what we use to finance debit balances and margin accounts. All right. Looks like Stephanie's next. Is there an easy way to remember income tax versus capital gains tax in regard to the 65? Eh, I don't know. Um, let me give it a try. Um, I don't know if this is easy or not, but we'll try it. Oh, God, I hope I don't have anybody else out in the waiting room again. Okay. All right. So the way I think of it, Dean thinks is a testament. I think of it as I have three baskets of income on my tax return, Stephanie. You know, I have paycheck income. That's me working for money. I have portfolio income. That's my money working for me. And I have passive. So those are the three things I'm going to be reporting on. Uh, we don't really care too much about your paycheck income or uh, earned income, you know, because, you know, what we're really interested in is your unearned income, you know, your portfolio. I mean, the idea is to get enough money working for you that you don't need to work for your money anymore, right? I think that's a great thing to be able to call customer and say, hey, Stephanie, we now have enough money working for you that you don't need to work for your money any longer. We've arrived at our financial destination. If tomorrow you don't want to go to work, instead of calling in sick, you can call in rich. Say, I can't see coming to work. I got an eye problem. I go, what's wrong with your eye? I, I can't see coming to work because I'm rich. Right? I feel very blessed. I mean, I have enough money working for me. I have more money working for me than I spend. Right? So, you know, my you know, people make fun of me because, you know, last week I was working my ass off and, you know, my family's like... Well, this is Jay Steen, why are you doing that? You don't need the, the money. I go, I know. I just, it's an accident. I didn't mean to work that hard. Uh, I was proud of myself. This Labor Day, I didn't do nothing. I napped and I read and I napped and read and read and napped. And oh, it was wonderful, right? <laughs> I told you this week, I said, yeah, I got to block off those every other week and I ain't going to be working on the weekends no more. Anyways, that's where we want to go. So most of your test questions are in this area and how this stuff gets taxed right? The stuff in your portfolio. And so uh, interest you receive on bonds, dividends you receive on stock are for the most part going to be taxed at your ordinary income tax rate. There are exceptions for that. I mean, you know, if it's a dividend, one corporation paid to another, it's 50% tax excludable. You know, if it's a muni bond, it's not federally taxed. It's federally tax exempt depending on where you live. But for the most part, that's going to be taxed at your ordinary income tax rate, whatever it is. Please note, I didn't call it ordinary income. I called it the rate you're getting taxed. You know, if it's a qualified dividend, maybe it's a lower rate than ordinary income. So there's some exceptions to that. But the only two ways you're going to make money is the income stream and or price appreciation on your investments. Right. So price appreciation is uh, depends on two things. We have what's called your cost basis, and that simply is, Stephanie, when you turn your money into the investment. Pretty straightforward. You turn your money into the investment, and then you, at some point, are going to turn the investment back into money. That's called sales proceeds. And you're going to owe taxes on the difference between your cost basis and the sales proceeds. And that's either going to be taxed at ordinary income tax rate if it's a short-term gain, or it's going to be taxed at a lower rate. You should seek this, a long-term gain. And that's going to be if you've been at risk for more than 12 months, right? So more than 12 months, you're going to qualify for long-term capital gain. So uh, over here, let's say on my paycheck income, I've got uh, $90,000. 
And when I net up all my gains and losses, realized watching my stocks go up and down isn't taxable. But if, you know, I sell those stocks or sell those bonds, then it's going to be a gain or loss. I net it all out and I've lost $17,000. So the question is, uh, can I reduce my paycheck income? And the answer is yes. I can say I made $87,000. I can take $3,000 of that $17,000 over there. And what do I do with the $14,000? It carries over. Yeah, I carry it forward, right? And, you know, at the end of the year, I might say, hey, Stephanie, you know, uh, maybe we should uh, look at your portfolio and see if we got some losses we can harvest. It might be time to take a loss because you have some gains over here, right? We're trying to match it up. I, I don't live in this world, Stephanie, but <laughs> Rupert Murdoch in his portfolio lost $100 million on a stock car fraud called Theranos. And he said, yeah, that's okay. I need a $100 million loss against my gains from selling Fox to Disney. Uh, man, I wish I lived in that world, right? He's made a billion in the Disney transaction. So minus 100 million, he made 900 million. You know, I mean, he still loves her, even though she's going to prison, you know, and a uh, man, you know, she's quite the operator, you know, defrauds the guy and he's still, you know, who knows, the rumor's going to go see her. <laughs> Maybe he'll, he'll go see her while she's in prison. Um, passive is my distributions for my partnerships. So, you know, if I have partnerships, I'm going to get distributions from those. And those are completely walled off. I can only use passive uh, income against passive losses. So, you know, we're going to have passive income, passive losses. You can't take a loss from a partnership anywhere. It's kind of stuck over there. So, you know, stepping against suitability would be if I have a customer, like, for example, uh, I would want to match a, a passive income with a passive loss or vice versa. You know, the way I think of it, it's not testable, but I think of it as I want to match my pigs with my pounds. My passive income generators with my passive activity losses. Right? You know, I had a doctor one time and he had told me that uh, he appreciates the due diligence toward tasting. I took him on the line and he said, Dean, it's embarrassing. I have all these partnerships. And so one more partnership is just ridiculous. I'm not going to invest, but, you know, I got all these tax shelters and I said, well, doctor, as you know, you just told me you got all these packs of activity losses. They're not doing anything for you. He said, well, yeah, they're, they're kind of trapped. I go, yeah. So, you know, I think you need to make a bigger asset allocation because this winery throws off passive income. I think you need to make a bigger investment. I was originally thinking you should invest 100000 but now I think you need to invest 300000 because that would give you enough passive income to suck up those losses over there. Or vice versa, right? I might say, hey, doctor, why don't we take a flyer on an oil and gas exploratory program? Why don't we be aggressive? Because if we don't find oil, at least we can do what with those passive activity losses. We can uh, use them to offset passive income. Uh, other thing I would just know is that if you are have a qualified plan, you can reduce that 87 further by funding an IRA, for example, or putting money into a 401k, right? With an employee match, you can also take it down that way. So there's a nice overview. I have a video you can check out called uh, ta uh, Death and Taxes is the name of the video. And then it says just uh, taxes. So I don't really talk about death. Uh, there are test questions about tax consequences when people die, though. You should definitely know there's a step up in the basis, the cost basis when somebody dies. So lots of dead people questions. All right. So there we go. Is there a way to do that? Can you go over the dividend discount model? and dividend discount cash flow. So Paige, I just linked literally just minutes ago uh, in a uh, video description of our live stream page to a tutoring replay where I do that for 45 minutes. I go over, it's called analytical methods. I just, just put it into that playlist and you can check that out. Uh, were you in our live stream page? You weren't because I just did that literally for like 20 minutes about 30 minutes ago. <laughs> but I'll be watching that then. Well, that's okay. That's it. That's okay. It's not, you know, I get it. I get it. So uh, can I go over dividend discount model? Dis well, they're linked. Discounted cash flow as applied to a stock test question is known as, and you come up with dividend discount model. So, and what we're trying to do with discounted cash flow is we're trying to establish what's called present value. What is the present value? The money today is always worth more money uh, today than in the future. 
And so when we're talking about money in the future, what we're trying to do is say, okay, what is this money in the future going to be worth today? What is the present value? The classic example I use all the time, Paige, if you were on the live stream, here we go again with this dis uh, discussion. It's a classic. And the tutoring we play starts with the same thing. I win the lottery. They say, Dean, what would you like? A million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars for the next 15 years each year? Would you like a million dollars today? Or would you like a hundred thousand 15 years, 15 payments of a hundred? I had paid somebody who I was using this analogy and I, I'll say the same story. I said, yeah, in my career, I'm not a math guy. You know, and you don't have to be a math person to pass these tests. And I think people sometimes go overkill. Paige, I hit the Zoom link and the guy shows up and he said, Dean, I'm not paying you $250 an hour to do math with me. I'm a serious math geek. I can do math. So let's just skip to the chase on that. And I said, okay, you know, wonderful. And then he, good news, he passed, but he said, Dean, I wish I would have spent more time like memorizing formulas because you know, they didn't ask me to do the math. I could do the math, but I didn't know the formula. So I had to re kind of spend a lot of time trying to reverse engineer it. And I wish I would have just, you know, aim and shoot point and click kind of on it. Anyways, I had said in this uh, live stream that I would, uh, when I had to do math and it was serious, I'd call Lee. He's the smartest math guy I've ever known. And he's as smart as anybody you'll ever meet. So I know my guy is, and then this guy said in the live stream, you shouldn't be in our business if you can't do your own math. I go, Wow. I said, man, there's a lot of people in our business who are very successful who don't do their own math and choose not to or can't do it. It's really just you the implications. It's the input of the math, not getting into the math. So I say, Lee, what's the present value of uh, $100,000 a year for 15 years? He says, Dean, a million two. I'm taking the payments. Right? Because a million two is better than the million. Right? We have a present value of a million. We have another present value of a million two. The way we say that page is my hundred thousand dollar payments have a net present value of two hundred thousand, meaning I should take the payments, right? I mean that's the if he calls me and says, Dean, the uh, present value of the payments is eight hundred thousand, then I'm taking the million, right? Because again, the million has the eight hundred has negative net present value, so there's this concept of present value, but also as it relates to net present value. Right. So uh, we're usually doing that in a bond investment. Right. So in that video replay, I just put up page. Uh, there is a uh, bond and we're looking at the bond in the tutoring session and deciding whether it's overvalued, undervalued, or is the market efficient? Efficient means it's, you know, the bond's 920 and it's priced at 920. Right. So uh, that's what we're doing that now. In that example, I think in the tutoring session, we had 20 payments I think of $30 because it's a 10 year bond. It pays twice a year. It's not so much. Can we do the math? It's that if the present value is X, should we, or should we not buy the bond? Right. So as it applies to stocks, uh, the one I always use is bank of America it pays 21 cents a quarter. So I'm saying, okay, what is the present value of all those dividends I'm getting four times a year? I'm getting 21 cents and I'm going to discount that back and get present value. Let's say, Present value is 30 and Bank of America is 28. I say, ooh, I'm going to buy it. I got $2 of net present value. I can pay 28 for a present value of 30. Good deal. Or if I do a uh, present value and it's uh, 32 and the stock's at 30, I go, uh, excuse me, if I do present value and it's 32 and the stock's at, uh, you know, 34, I'll say, no, thank you. Why should I do that, right? Now, you also have a version of this where I got a guy in a comment on the YouTube channel and he didn't listen carefully. And here's what he asked me. He said, Dean, did you say that you can't do the dividend uh, growth model on a common stock? I said, no, I said the opposite. I said, we could assume that Bank of America's dividend is going to go from 21 cents to 24 cents. Right? Because, you know, it has gone up. It was 18, now it's 21. And that's called the dividend growth model. And I said the opposite. You can't apply that page to preferred stocks because the dividends don't grow, right? So you can only use dividend discount model. And then the other test question would be, what would result in a higher valuation of Bank of America? If you're doing valuation, like book value, price to book, you're doing fundamental analysis, or you're doing this, what we're doing here, and you're applying this, 
what would result in you being willing to pay a higher price? A higher valuation would be the dividend growth model, right? If you assume the dividend is going to go up, you're willing to pay more money. You know, another uh, valuation page is price to earnings. And you could assume that the earnings are going up or they're going down. It looks like Jane that left in here. Okay, Stephanie, I've seen a few questions to screen share. Uh, you have a few questions. Are they Kaplan questions? Where are they coming from, Stephanie? And if I'm on mute button for there for a second. Uh, it's uh, still training consultants. I have, I'm going to be starting Kaplan uh, okay. tomorrow. All right. So let's see what else we got first, and we'll finish with your shared screen questions. Okay. Uh, Muni security documentation. Uh, I like that. There we go. Now we're talking Alana. And she narrowed down her question, right? I call it a ghost question. When you say, Dean, somewhere in the materials, there's a question that goes something like, you know, that's kind of hard to kill. You say, page 137, third paragraph. That's easier to kill. Uh, I highly recommend, Alana, uh, that you take a sheet of paper and you fold it in half. And on one side, write all the terms associated with GO bonds. And on the other, all the terms associated with revenue bonds. Because that is a big part uh, of the exam. I guess I should clean up my whiteboard here. So boom, boom. And so we'll put uh, geos over here. And we'll put revenues over here because they love to say all wine are associated with, right? And then your point about documentation, they love to torment you with that. Right, what else have you got there? I think that's pretty good. All right, so uh, let's do it together. So. GOs, uh, how about voter approval? Where does that go? GO or revenue? Revenue? And voter approval goes to GOs. There is no voter approval, Christine, for a revenue bond. There's no stickiness to you as a taxpayer, right? I always like to you know, look for the sign I sometimes see it, sometimes I don't. At certain airports, I know where it's at. And at San Francisco Airport, uh, when you pull in, it says your taxpayer dollars not at work. Your taxpayer is not at work. You're not paying for the airport. Who's paying for the airport? The users, right? These are backed by user fees. These are backed by taxes. I joke, taxes are the price you pay for civilization. The more civilization you want, the more taxes you got to pay. Uh, how about ad valerum? Where does that go? How about feasibility study? Revenue. How about competitive facilities? How about collection ratio? How about overlapping debt? How about debt service coverage ratio? How about uh, net revenue pledge? You get the idea? Again, Alana, you can actually watch a tutoring replay on Muni Bonds where we spent an hour and a half doing this. Just going through all the terms associated with geos and revenues. There's also a Muni Bond class replay. Uh, documentation, test question. We have a notice of sale. The notice of sale means it's a competitive underwrite. And the notice of sale test question will be published in the bond buyer. The bond buyer is a newspaper widely read in the municipal market. Uh, we don't have prospectuses when selling muni bonds. We don't have prospectuses when selling muni bonds. Because muni bonds are exempt. They're an exempt issue under 33. So we do have a prospectus-like document called an official statement. That's the prospectus-like document. 
we have test question, a trust indenture. The trust indenture is a contract between the issuer and the trustee for the benefit of the bondholders. And in here we would have, whether it's net revenue or gross revenue pledge, all the promises are revolu uh, resolutions. Uh, net revenue, remember, means that operations maintenance fund has priority. I'm assuming you're taking a Series 7 because this is completely Series 7. This is not SIE. This is not 65. This is Series 7. And it has all the promises or resolutions. The fancy word for promises or resolution is covenants. Promises, we might say on the test, bond resolutions. And that's a challenge to lots of different words for things, right? Um, let's see, are we missing any of those? are the big documents, uh, big documents. Um, uh, remember, there's subcategories here. So, you know, it's either a GO or revenue, but in this revenue category, remember, you have subcategories. You have IDRs, IDAs. Uh, you have special assessment bonds, right? You have moral obligation bonds, right? You have over here, you have double barreled. Uh, okay, uh, I think that's a good overview, Alana, but again, uh, put that into the channel search bar. Uh, munis, you'll find out those there. You can watch class replays. I have a whole video on underwriting munis. That's very testable. The components of the spread, the participants. I have an entire video on that. Uh, I have divided versus undivided syndicates there. So I have lots of lots of content on munis. If you're taking a seven, the three biggest categories are munis, options, and mutual funds. That's like 60 questions on the series seven. So that's where the big beef of the seven is. Uh, let's see, an investor wants to buy a foreign stock that's trading at $540 per share and paying a $1,250 dividend. The investor's registered rep instead suggests purchasing an ADR, which represents 10% of the value. If the customer commits to buying 500 shares, what is the cost base and his first semi-annual dividend? This is ridiculous. I don't know who your test prep vendor is, but that's ridiculous. You would recommend the ADR because of ease of ownership and transparency. As an ADR, you're going to get three 10Qs and a 10K, and the accounts are going to be translated from the foreign currency into U.S. currency. Uh, you do not have proportion ownership rights. You don't have the right of first free preemptive rights in an ADR. So I think that's what they're getting at. Uh, did they give us the currency exchange rate? It pays $12.50 annual dividend. What is his cost base? Well, if foreign stock is trading, well, his cost base is 540, right? And he bought, did it tell us how 500 shares? So 500, that's where that is. Uh, I'm not sure what you're struggling on because that would be in dollars. There's no, it's all in dollars. That's the point, right? The ADR is purchased in dollars. So that's $540 times 500. And then you got 500 shares paying you 1250, right? And it's not a sim, it's, I don't even like it. I, again, I don't know who your, your vendor is, but it's not semi-annual. The dividend is paid quarterly, so I'm not sure, even sure why it tells you that, right? The cost base is simply, as I told Stephanie, when you turn your money into the investment. So your cost base is 500 times 540. So why do interest rates rise during inflation? Because, Nate, I just told you, how does the Fed fight inflation? What did they do when inflation was eight and interest rates were two? What did they do? They raised interest rates. They went from, and again, it was eight. They raised it to three. It still was too high. They went to four. They went to five. And so raising interest rates is how you fight inflation. How do, why do interest rates rise during deflation? They typically don't. Deflation is too many goods and not enough money. And so here you, it's, that's even more dangerous. People won't buy things. Why would I spend my money? when my money will buy me more in the future. So deflation even more. So again, Nate, I don't know who your vendor is, but there is no question about rising interest rates and deflation. The, the test question is about inflation and we measure it, test question by the consumer price index. And you know, tips keep pace and common stock beats it. 
Uh, IED, is this a Kaplan question, Jane? Looks like we got some Kaplan questions here. Christina, those are Series 7, so she knows the drill all Series 7. Okay, let's go get the Kaplan Q bank. Did, did, Stephanie, did we take care of your, your shared screen questions yet? No, oh. but it's okay. Go ahead with the Kaplan. Okay, so we'll do, here's where we're at. It's 650. I'm going to do these Kaplan questions, and we're going to do Stephanie's questions, and we're all calling it a night. Okay. Sound like a plan? All right, let me go get the Kaplan Quebec. Boom, boom, boom. I got a little nervous today. I, told, I think if you were in the live stream, the, my Kaplan discount code for some reason wasn't working. To, and people were telling me it wasn't working. I called Kaplan. And, you know, the senior people there said, oh, Dean, we're sorry, man. It wasn't supposed to expire. We're taking care of it. And I said, okay, get it done. And then and then uh, I found out my Kaplan email was suspended. Oh, what's going on? Apparently, I just tried too many times to log in. I hate when the company's security is such that if you, you know, I think it's like your third time, you don't put it in right, then it just completely locks up on you. I'm like, oh, my God. All right, let's see. I got to go find the Kaplan Q Bank. There we go. Kaplan sign in. And Series 7. Um, yeah, let me go find you guys. Can you guys see my screen? Yep. Okay, let me get the chat out. And do, 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 do. And it looks like our first one is one five four nine two five four. Uh, the risk of a bond decreasing in value during periods of inflation. Well, you should definitely know the inverse relationship of interest rates and bond prices. You should definitely know that when interest rates go up, bond prices go what? Down. So can you say goodbye, Silicon Valley Bank? What happened to Silicon Valley Bank? They had bonds, long-term bonds. The Fed started raising interest rates because they were fighting inflation. And what happened to the value of their bond portfolio? If brand new bonds pay five and yours only pay three, they're worth less. Now, that wouldn't be a problem if Silicon Valley Bank could hold them to maturity. But then I think they were foolish. And they said they so far had a $2 billion loss on their bond portfolio. Unrealized. But they're, then their depositors started saying, what? I'm out of here. And then they started wanting their money. And then what Silicon Valley Bank have to do with the bonds? Sell them and realize the loss, right? So... Now, you would think bankers would know about interest rate risk. But yeah, that's very testable. So I think I actually had confused it um, because I know that Kaplan sometimes asks kind of uh, what's the risk um, if the market is going down and then it asks about like the coupon payments. Well, so I think in that case- When they say market, they don't mean the bond market. They mean the stock market. Oh, right. I'm sorry. I meant like the interest rates. Yeah, so you have, there's only two risks in bonds. The two risks on bonds are interest rate and credit risk. Credit risk is the risk of default. And again, you can diversify away from that. That's again called non-systematic risk. The way to avoid credit risk is to you know have a diversified bond portfolio of bonds. It's unlikely every bond in your mutual fund is going bankrupt or defaulting. Interest rate risk, you cannot diversify away. I don't care what bond you got. Interest rates go up, the bond is going what? going down now what did you answer did you have one you like better well i kept them conf i always confuse um well i know it's different but like um for reinvestment risk or purchasing power well, reinvestment risk, risk test question would be a declining interest rate environment okay okay and it would be again the way you could avoid that is a zero coupon bond 
because mm -hmm. a zero coupon bond, you're not getting money every six months. So you don't have to reinvest. Your rate of return is locked in. So that'd be a different answer for a different question. All right, what's our next one? Our next one is 155. Uh, eight seven six nine. A customer short ten A B C. December fifty calls at two and a half, and short uh, ten December fifty puts at three and a half. That is a short straddle. So uh, we're going to combine the premiums, which is two and a half and three and a half is six. Our break even is fifty six and forty four. We're short, so we want it in between 56 and 44. Uh, 40, 50. So is 40, 50 in between 44 uh, and 50, uh, 56? And it's not. That's outside our break evens. Uh, let's see. So customer is short. Oh, we got 10 of them. So we're short 10, 50 calls at two and a half. We're short 10, 50 puts at three and a half. So that's six. So 56. And minus 644. Uh, before expiration, ABC declines to 45. The customer is assigned on the put. So that means I bought the stock at 50 and the short calls expire. So uh, I believe in doing a T here. And so let's just get our T fired up. And I believe I'm doing these on a per share basis. And so we got two and a half. I'll put that in green. We got three and a half. Boom. All right. So now it tells me uh, the customer is assigned on the put position. So that means I have to buy the stock at the strike price. So that's 50 out. And it tells me the short calls expire. Uh, a month later, I sell the stock for 45. And so now what I do is I just net the columns. And so I have 50 out. And I've got 51 in. So I think I'm a winner. And so I made one point uh, on 10 contracts, each governing 100 shares, which means I made $1,000. So that was kind of confusing uh, because they are giving us a time clock question. Right? So, you know, I thought it was going to be uh, we're outside the break evens and it's going to be a loss, but then they, they, they continue on, right? They didn't tell you did anything at 40 and a half. So that was, I think, the confusing part. It says the customer, then they tell you what happened. The customer has signed on the put. And then, so this one was a tough one. Uh, any question on that one? Do you see how we did that, Christina? Yeah, makes sense. Um, money just, to out clarify, versus money just to clarify, when they say the customer is assigned on his put position. Contract specification is very testable. So you should know that if you're a short put and you get exercise, that's very testable. That means you're going to buy the stock at the strike price. You should know a short I think I think put, sign. right? Are we clear? When you short a put, when you short a put, you get paid. You know, I don't get it. I sell it to buy it. I say, when you sell a put contract, when you sell a put contract, you are obligated to buy the stock. If you didn't want to buy that stock at 50, you shouldn't have sold that put contract. Right? What would it mean if you got assigned on the call contract? That would mean you sold the stock at 50. So those are contract specifications. You should know that long call of you exercise, you're buying the stock at the strike. Short call, you get assigned or exercised, you're selling at 50. If you're short a put and you get exercised, you're buying the stock at the strike price. Right? So that's called contract specifications. I always tell you, if you're good at contract specifications and you can track money, you get 100 on options. Right? Contract specifications means you know what that means. But it is to get exercised. Short puts are the ones I think that always give people a problem. So I'm not worried when somebody's confused in a way I see most people get confused. I get worried when somebody's confused in some way I've never seen somebody confused before. 
you know, uh oh, a bond is selling at a discount. So you should have fired up your tea, your cedar teeter totter. So there's a bond at par. Anybody remember what the middle of the teeter totter is? The nominal yield. Yep. Yeah. And so it says the bond is selling at a discount. So there's our current yield, there's our yield of maturity, there is our yield of gold. And indeed, the nominal yield is less than. So I'm not sure where the problem was on this. You should definitely be able to do this. There was another answer choice, and it seemed right to me. Yield to maturity goal is below. It was um. Well, B would be not true. Bond B is for a bond at a premium. The current yield would be higher. That's a bond at a premium. The yield of call will always be lower. That's a bond at a premium. So those are all the opposite directions, right? So. Okay. Okay. Yep. All right. Our next one is one five five eight zero seven four. All the following state. Oh, here we go. I think was it Alana wanted to talk about documents. So they're asking about an official statement. Our true accept. So we only have to give it to you if you ask for it. If we have a disclosure document, we better what? Give it to you, right? So it says all retail purchasers should get one. Yes, yes, yes. So I'm not sure what you were struggling in here. It's not upon request. If we have a prospectus or an official statement, we must give it to somebody. Uh, mm -hmm. Christina, very testable. A technical analysis. You are held accountable for head and shoulders patterns. And a head and shoulders pattern test question is a signal of a reversal. It's a signal of a reversal. So we have two. We have the regular head and shoulders pattern. The regular head and shoulders pattern is the end of the bull and the beginning of the bear. Inverted head and shoulders would be the end of the bear and beginning of the bull. So that's very testable. Uh, marketing rule for five, six, series 66. Uh, I'm not sure, Paige, what you mean by the marketing rule. Uh, the mainly the differences between what are called testimonials, which are allowed from actual clients and endorsements, which are not, where you can't actually pay somebody. So that's pretty straightforward. Okay, let's see what's next. Ordinary income in long-term, well, it's very cool. There's no such thing as a ordinary income in long-term capital gain. Ordinary income, please, again, we already talked about this, is a tax rate. It's a tax rate. And long-term capital gains is a tax rate. And so you're either going to be paying an ordinary income tax rate if it's short-term or a long-term capital gains rate if you've been at risk for more than 12 months. You apply which, you. it's easy, you only apply, this only is your portfolio. So I went over with Stephanie, I made three baskets. And I said in the basket called portfolio, there's only two tax rates, ordinary income tax rate and long-term, long-term. And I'm not sure you're writing on the screen. I, I give you permission to do that. I guess I did, huh? Uh, Christina, that's a big category. You're only going to get two or three questions on partnerships. Not a big deal. Margin and partnerships are not a big deal. Two, three questions on both, and they're very straightforward. Uh, I think you did an awesome job today, Christina. Uh, you must have had burning ears. I was chatting you up in the live stream how <laughs> well you did this uh, today. And so, you know, your thing is just managing your psyche, my friend. Don't, don't, uh, oh, you know, don't go down no rabbit holes, right? You already answered all the questions correctly about DPPs. How do we avoid being a corporation? We don't have freely transferable interests. We have a finite life. You answered questions about the distinction between the GP and the LP. So I think you're fine. You're, I think you're fine. Any tips for processing transactions? That's our other. We have like five Christinas. Uh, we have Christina without an H, and then we have like three or four Christinas with H's. Uh, I know when you were processing transactions. So Christina, I do have a memory aid device for processing transactions. It is called Other People's Money's Count or order peanuts, Mr. Carter. Order peanuts, Mr. Carter. Let me get up my screen here. Let me clean that up. 
let me get out a bigger spot. So the first place an order goes is to the order department. And the order department test question transmits the order to the appropriate market center, right? Either NASDAQ, New York, whatever the case may be. And then it goes to the peanut department or other people's money counts or order peanuts, Mr. Carter. That's the purchase and sales department. And what do they do? They generate confirmations and they uh, match trades. Remember those confirmations have to be in the mail by settlement. Then it goes to the margin department who determines whether monies or securities are due. And then the last place it goes is to the cashiering department who takes receipts of monies and or securities. So a good way to remember that is order peanuts, Mr. Carter, or other people's monies count. If you get this, it'll be a scrambled multiple, and they're going to ask you to put it back, uh, put it in chronological order. All right. Uh, taking this, do I have any, let's see. Do I have any tips for when taking the NAS exams since they are very law for? Yeah, half of it's a law test and half of it is, uh, you know, an investment test. Uh, Paige, I just linked literally in the video description uh, just moments ago from the live stream to three great videos uh, based on that part of the exam. Definitions and registrations of persons, which is, you know, how do we register broker dealers, agents of broker dealers, investment advisors, investment advisor reps. It's in the video description of the live stream that just concluded. I also have another video page. I just literally linked there called Who's Your Daddy? And your dad is either the SEC or the state, depending on what kind of investment advisor you are. And there's a video I just just linked there. And I told you I already linked to a, a video on net present value analytical methods. So that's all found there. Uh, the, I just would say in general, though, page NASA exams are, they are a slog. I mean, you know, and there's no real easy way. And you just got to, you got to respect it too. But I know you are, Paige, but a lot of people have a pep in their step once they pass their seven. And there's enough overlap that they feel un, uh, comfortable they shouldn't. And so, unfortunately, we have people who miss miss the 66 and find it very challenging. You know, and it's it's what's depressing about it because it's the third leg of your, for most people, that's the third and final leg of their testing journey. And it's kind of depressing that, you know, <laughs> almost get it done, right? So uh, respect the 66. I have a whole podcast episode page. I'll go back and link it in the video description that Brian and I did about, I don't know, it's kind of a negative podcast episode. Who fails the 66 and why? Oh, you know, we're usually trying to be positive and uplifting, but, you know, you know, fear can be a good motivator. <laughs> so <laughs> so I'll, I'll link to that one or you can find it on your own. I'll go back and link it as soon as we're done here. Uh, okay, I think it's your turn, Stephanie. I think you said you had uh, some uh, competitors questions. Uh, hmm, yeah, I had, uh, I do. Just share the screen. You, just, you know how to do that? Yes, yeah, so I have multiple screens, apparently. There we go. I okay, had three questions that I'm too. Okay, them. one of your I'm business on. clients has owned and operated his own business as his own proprietorship. Test question. Uh, this is for 65 and 66, both. Sole proprietor is the easiest business to form it and dissolve. Right, so you get tests on business structures, right? And the easiest business starts the sole provider. He now wants to do some retirement succession planning. Well, <laughs> that's going to be difficult. <laughs> I, I'm laughing because if you're the sole proprietor, you and the business are one and the same, right? I'm a LLC, Stephanie, but I'm a sole managing member LLC. So that just means it's me, right? Now there's advantages of not having my mom and my brother involved in the business. But some days I go, man, it'd be nice to get some help. Right? It'd be nice to get some help. Oh, over on the issue of legal structure of his business, uh, the best advice for him would be, you said he should form a general partnership. No, oh my God. Because that too has limited liabilities. Unlimited liabilities. So you haven't really accomplished much with a general partnership. Uh, let's see, A, incorporate the business and sell shares to a uh, Yeah, set up a C-corp. And then you could give somebody some stock. Uh, I like that one. Form a limited partnership. Now, you if he's the successor, you don't want him to be a limited partner. 
limited partners can't engage in the business, right? So it sees out. So sell the business now to a third party. Uh, that's what I would have told him, except he's he said he wants a successor, right? And I would I have a guy, I, lo I love him, but all he does every time I go visit him is bitch about his business. He makes a lot of money and he bitches about his employees. He bitches about the business, the state of California. And I finally said, why don't you just move? Or if you're that unhappy, sell the business or dissolve the business. And you got enough money. Why don't you come out to me in my off-grid location? You, we have John with your resources. You could buy a cow ranch for the kind of money you got. Right. So uh, I don't like that question too much. Uh, the one they have on the test is a family that is a general partnership. On year 65, 66, they have a question about a husband and wife who are uh, running the business as a general partnership. They're each general partners. And the question is, why would you recommend they dissolve the partnership and reorganize as an LLC? Anybody think they have the answer for that? Is it because that um, they could still be involved? But with, they yeah, can still right. So I have the past who is a managing member of Guru Exam Prep LLC, right? I have the flow through, but I don't have the liability, mm -hmm. right? So that's why they would do it. LLCs, you don't have unlimited liability as the managing member. Okay. Or as a partnership, you do. All right, what's your next one? Uh, the there? definition of investment advisor rep. I always like to think of the cast of characters. That's me. So if I'm Paige, I'm Stephanie. I go, oh, that's me. <laughs> They're asking about me because that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to become an investment advisor rep. All right. So would given the state would include a clerical employee who has a place of business in the state? No. Right, because clerical employees, if all they're doing is not making public contact, pushing paper around, they don't have to take a 65, 66. Right, so A's out. Uh, a tax planner located in a given state who's involved in, ooh, here's the key, soliciting, hmm. offering, or negotiating sales for an investment advisor. Well, that makes you an investment advisor up for sure. Yeah. So let's see, you said C. An officer of a federally covered advisor uh, who has clients in a particular state, but has a main place of business in another state. Well, remember, the reason you missed this is because if you're federally covered, you aren't state. It says any given state. Okay, if you're federally covered, you're not going to register. Gotcha. Right? I was asking if you thought it comes back to the question. Yeah. Yeah. So that's not a bad miss, but uh, it's B. Uh, the president of an investment advisor is an age of the broker dealer. Well, that's a six. That's a seven. No, oh, that may that may or may not be you. But if you have a six, you have a seven. You're an agent of a broker dealer. If you combine that with a sixty-five or sixty-six, then you're an agent of a broker dealer and an investment advisor rep. And again, that's a conflict of interest to be representing both a broker dealer and an investment advisory firm. Okay, you just got to what disclose it. Mm -hmm. Right, sunlight's the best disinfectant. Yep. So you know, I say, hey, I am both. Um, uh, the agent recommends purchase. The uh, president earns a commission. I think they're trying to cloud our mind with this president thing. I mean, I, I don't really think so far the president has anything to do with this. Uh, but not the commissions. He earns a commission, and the IE earns a fee, but not the commission's compensation. The AI has. Well, it looks like you got this one right. Uh, yeah, you should know not disclosing is definitely a problem in any question. It was more, more or less that they gave me an obvious answer, but the question itself would confuse me what they were trying to ask. Well, me. I, all <laughs> test prep vendors, I think, are pretty good at what I call the Jedi mind trick, where they try <laughs> and give you a lot of stuff and get your mind going somewhere else. You know, what I like sometimes to do is just, you know, read the answer set first sometimes, read the last sentence first, just to see where it all winds up. Okay. Because sometimes if I just read the answer set, I can sometimes get the answer without even reading the question. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I shop the answer set and I say, ooh, fail to satisfy by not disclosing. That sounds like, you know, if I have like an answer that says it's stipulating the prospectus, I go, man, I like that. I don't know what the question is, but that sounds pretty damn good. <laughs> I, no. All right. Got another one? No, that was it. Okay. So let me just check chat one more time. 
uh, Christina, you did really well on DVP. So I, I don't want to mess with where you're at already. I, you know, you know, our, our Hippocratic oath is first do no harm. Right. So, you know, I don't think anything we could say would be helpful. Uh, geos and revenues. Yep. Yep. That's a big part. STC. There you go. Uh, I think we're done. Okay. Ladies, did we get any gentlemen? Do we get no gentlemen today? No gentlemen. Wow. Did I, I think did one we, left? Did we, Nate? Oh, Nate left. Okay. Well, we had one gentleman, huh? So, oh, now I can, now I can talk about uh, the uh, gentleman versus the ladies. Yeah, mom. Uh, I no, I think I'm fine. You sure? Yep, yep. Be be safe. Okay. I always have mom check in when she's coming, going, or coming, so I make sure she's, you know, she is missing for 20, 30 minutes, and I put out the SOS. Right. I'm about to buy her one of those tile things to put in her car. I was proud of her. She didn't panic the other day. She had to get on the freeway, and the police officer made her, and she did it. Um. Okay. Two two things. Uh, uh, ladies investment clubs on average do better than men investment clubs. And there's a lot of thesis for why. And, you know, psychologists are fascinated why the lady investment clubs on average do better than men. And here's one of the thesis is hypothesis. I like this psychologist said he thinks it's because the ladies are better at consensus on investment ideas than the guys are. But the guys get into whose idea was it and we used your idea last time and it's my turn and they start bashing each other. Whereas the ladies say, hey, if it makes us money, who cares? <laughs> I like that. Uh, the other one was on the actuarial tables. Uh, people are fascinated that the ladies tend to live longer than the guys. And there's a lot of hypothesis about why the ladies tend to live longer than the guys. One I like, you know, hypothesis means like the efficient market hypothesis. may not be true, but it explains things. And I like this one. They said the ladies are more adaptable to changing circumstances than the guys are, particularly as they get older. Like, you know, the guys get more into like, oh, you know, I have a friend and he he lost a really good job and he got an offer for a job that didn't pay as much. It was like a 150,000 instead of like 300. And his wife was telling me she wanted him to take it because just to get him off the couch. And, you know, she was saying, you know, I wish he would take the 150 and work his way back up to the 300. And, uh, you know, I think it's fascinating. So the ladies too will take a step back if necessary to take another step forward. Whereas the guys are, nope, I'm not going backwards <laughs> under any circumstances. So, uh, by the way, I had somebody complain that I made a derogatory a comment about ladies. I said, no, no, no. When they, the HR department called me, I said, no, no, no. My comment wasn't derogatory to the lady. It was derogatory to the gentleman. <laughs> that was the people we were taking the shot at. <laughs> So, all right, last call. I just wanted to say thank you for the shout out to my battle buddies because they were, one had failed and she was stressing about it last Friday and the other one thought that he was going to fail last Thursday. I'm just so proud of Stephanie, them. Stephanie, I just wish all of us had battle buddies. I really mm -hmm. do. I mean, it's just so much easier, uh, you know, when you have a battle buddy. I mean, it, by, by the way, I would include it a support network as being a battle buddy. It doesn't necessarily have to be somebody who's taking the test. Uh, because I feel sorry when people don't have a support network of any kind. They're just, they're having to do this on their own. Uh, you know, uh, you know, they don't have a significant other or a roommate or a good boss. You know, or a good boss is somebody who's encouraging. You know, man, I had a guy who said, could you please lighten up on these people? I mean, you know, I I, I get that fear is a good motivator, but he'd walk by the, every day and go, don't pass this, you're out of here. I said, well, gee, you know, why don't you try a little raw raw, you know, man? Like, hey, I wouldn't have hired you if I didn't think you could pass. And if you pass, you're going to make a lot of money. That might work a little better, <laughs> you know, playing up on people's fears. So I just wish, Stephanie, everybody had a battle buddy. So, you know, if we can step into the breach a little bit, uh, I think that sense of community, uh, you know, we see some of the same people these Tuesday evenings. Uh, that's the reason I'm not opening up more Tuesday evenings like this, because uh, I think this is a little better than the live stream in terms of camaraderie and being able to do things on the whiteboard and the live stream is a little more difficult to do things. Uh, we'll do both. And I'm adding some more. So uh, hopefully if we, uh, they're not blessed like you and don't have a battle buddy, maybe we can stand in and uh, be part of their community or support network as much as we can. Uh, I have help. weekly Monday meetings with, uh, with several people that are licensing and I encourage them every single week saying, come on Tuesdays. There is yeah. a million people yeah. in your boat. 
Yeah, you know, it, it's funny, but people really do like the bell and they like the, you know, uh, you know, uh, I really think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, where do you find uh, buddies? That's a good, good question, Alana. <laughs> you know, um, I, I, we have, I, I, I we're, we're working on it. We're working on it. So here's what I would tell you, Alana. Uh, we have in our, I think the best thing, well, the, well I shouldn't say best, efficient. Uh, in our Facebook group, there are chats for each of the different series. And so, uh, you know, study buddy, battle buddy, I like it. Uh, I would say go over to our baby brokers doing hat tricks and go into the chat for your particular series and just say, hey, looking for a battle buddy or looking for a study buddy or study group. Uh, that's one way to go about it. I've been trying when I see people looking for that to then cross promote it by putting it on our, our reddits and also putting it in the community posts of the channel. So I'm hoping a lot of will get better at that. Right now, it's 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 you know it's not all it could be. I I think I think we could have a better support network with what we have so far. Uh, we, you know, it's always a work in progress. So um, the channel itself, we have coming up on five million views and thirty thousand subscribers, and so there's a lot of people there. But trying to get people to connect is kind of a little more tough because there, you know, somebody sends me a a post and I respond to it, but it's not really interactive it's kind of like uh yeah you know kudos <laughs> so uh yeah i think everybody if you can uh, yeah by the way and i always say reach out to the people who are around you and say hey listen i'm emotionally fragile right now i'm studying for a test you know anything you can do to kind of help me protect my psyche would be greatly appreciated you know uh, i sometimes say i would make two sets of flashcards one i actually use to study and one i use to get rid of people who are bothering me while i'm studying and I'd say, hey, honey, can you run the flashcards with me? And on that one, I would have like disintermediation, hypothecation. Maybe they last like 20 minutes, but they say, ooh, I should leave you alone. Now, it's a, 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 that's assuming you don't have a demented significant other who is into this stuff. Hey, let's run the flashcards. You know, so you know, sometimes we get, you know, people are in the business together. So there might not be any uh, there, but that's the other thing I would do is definitely give yourself permission to talk to people. And, you know, invite them to to be involved and, you know, be careful. You don't want them too much in your business. It's always a fine line. But, you know, saying, hey, I'm studying and any support you can provide, you know, I'd, I'd make it clear you're not asking for money or whatever, just emotional support or whatever. And uh, I think that COVID is what really, that's why I started the channel, by the way, because I just didn't know if I was ever going to get to teach a live class again. And I think post COVID, we're trying to get people to come back in the office, but there is way more people now that are doing this on their own. Uh, you know, and like even now, like Zoom than in the old days where there's 30 or 40 of us taking the test and we do a cram course and I come on campus Monday through Thursday, we take a practice test Friday, we test Monday, you know, we go have some drinks and, you know, uh, you know, so that's just, I don't know if that's ever going to come back in our business. That's so much part of our, our mentorship and learning. And so I can see, you know, when David Solomon is the CEO of Goldman Sachs, Jamie Dimon, J.P. Morgan, uh, Brian Monahan in our business. A lot of the uh, people, uh, Citibank, I forget what her name is, want people to come back to the office just for a lot of reasons. You know, it's not because a lot of what you learn is institutional memory. And if it's kind of hard to get that if you're, you're not in the office, right? So I think it's like what some of these firms now, it's like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you're supposed to be in the office. And uh, who knows, maybe some... Uh, Vanguard, Fidelity, Schwab, maybe the bigger places will go back to the cohort where they have, you know, a group of people that are all testing and they're all going through this together. So it's nice when you have somebody in a similar situation. I always love our victorious test takers who uh, take the time to come back and, and tell us of their victory. Because I always think that Stephanie, that's always good for a morale boost too, right? Particularly those ones who struggled maybe like tonight we had the two people who it was their second time out. And then we had somebody who's third. I mean, I prefer you pass the first time, as I always say. But, you know, that takes, uh, that's always good for morale too. When there's somebody struggling, say, you know, I used to say I got in trouble for this, but I had a guy who worked for me. Kelly, his name was Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie, his name was Kelly. And so when you came to work for me, I'd say, Stephanie, go say hi to Kelly and then come back here. And then when you'd come back in the office, I'd say, if that guy can pass, you can pass. I feel like writing Finran saying, could you check his score? Are you sure he really passed? So another thing you can do when you have motivational difficulty is go to the person at your firm you can't believe passed. 
Don't tell them that's why you're at the desk. Hopefully, you know, everybody doesn't go to the same person's desk. That wouldn't be embarrassing. Right? <laughs> but you just go over there. And go, oh, yeah. Okay. That person did it. I can do it. I had two guys. They were study buddies, battle buddies, deputy, and they both passed. And one of the guys, I I just was really surprised because he just really didn't have a, a attention span that I thought was necessary. I mean, he just was easily distracted. And I said, listen, I, you know, cut love. I said, I don't know what you need to do, but you need to get away and, uh, you know, maybe get a hotel room and your some study materials and lock yourself away. He didn't have the resources to do that. But what he did was he took up a tent and went camping with his study materials, kind of a, a version of what I suggested, but with you know, lower economic costs. He passed. Anyways, the other guy was uh, Bill and the, this guy was uh, Dave. And I was pumping his hand. I was like, man, that's so great. And then the bill guy goes, well, what about me? And I said, well, we knew you were going to pass. But him, we didn't think he was going to make it. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> so, uh, so it's always good when you get some uh, somebody who uh, passes. And I get that on the channel, too. I have a lot of people who thought they weren't going to pass, and they get lucky. Lucky, stars line up, get a good draw, and they pass. And, uh, you know, so it's always good. All right, everybody, we've been at about a little bit over an hour. So last call. I'll see you Tuesday after next. If you want to do this again, uh, office hours are available. Uh, I also make them available if you are a participant. So I usually say paid student, but sometimes if you're active, like a guy like Daniel, I'll let you into the office hour. And I think that is tomorrow. Is we have an office hour tomorrow or next Wednesday? I think. And then I think we have a customer account class tomorrow night. I think. All right. Uh, Mom's on her way home, so I'll let you guys go, and I'll see you either next Tuesday, if not sooner. Thanks, Dean. You bet. Remember, inch by inch, your 66 is a cinch. Yard by yard, your 66 is hard. Substitute your exam, 65, 7, 6, whatever. Bye-bye.